Hello everybody, welcome back to this video. Today we are going to be watching uh, part 3 of Kings and Generals um, uh, le video series about the Great Northern War. If you haven't already checked out the first two, uh, go and check them first. Otherwise this wouldn't really make a lot of sense. Um, if you like the video, please like and subscribe and leave a comment of, on what you thought of it. And uh, of course, go and check the original creators, Kings and Generals. They do amazing work with their uh, their history series. Anyway, let's watch this. In the beginning of the Great Northern War, it seemed that Sweden was isolated by its enemies that would soon win the conflict. However, by the middle of 1702, it proved to be anything but as Charles XII, the soldier king of Sweden, had defeated all of his initial opponents in battle and was close to total domination. As the Swedish victories mounted, so did her enemies' eagerness to dismantle the empire. Just as the king of Poland, Augustus II, was licking his wounds after the defeat at Klisov, the Russian bear came out of its winter slumber and began planning its next attack. The good news is that you don't need a time machine to experience historical epic warfare. The sponsor of this video, Epic War Thrones, is a free to and experience real war in an epic fashion by downloading Epic War Thrones via the link in the description. Well, uh, all I have to say very quickly is that it says that Sweden is completely isolated. That's not entirely true. Of course, um, they are facing a lot of enemies. But um, the entire, one of the reasons why Denmark joined the war was because Holstein was aligned with Sweden. And we did not, we wanted Holstein, specifically the Schleswig areas of Holstein, Gottrop. And uh, because in our eyes, Sweden could attack from here, Holstein could attack from here, plus they could attack Holstein here, and yeah, Sweden from there, plus it could be used as a gateway for the German, the Swedish lands in Germany to launch an attack through there. So, um, yeah, uh, it wasn't completely isolated, but, but I get what he says. Following the Battle of Klisov, the Swedish army advanced towards Krakow, while Augustus fled to Sandomierz. The governor of Krakow was unwilling to surrender his city without a fight. However, he changed his mind after a Swedish display of force in front of the city walls. A couple of weeks later, a 12,000-strong Swedish army from Pomerania arrived in Krakow as well. Augustus, seeing the gravity of the situation, left Sandomierz with 4,000 cavalry and advanced towards Warsaw to retake it. He had hoped to call for another diet and gather military and financial support from the nobility. The diet did not go according to his plans, though, as an increasing number of noblemen voiced their dissatisfaction with the fact that Augustus involved the Commonwealth in the war. Several noblemen even threatened to openly back Charles in the conflict. Again, I said it before, but Poland, very divided nation this time. Some of the noblemen had voted for Augustus, some had not, and now where he have uh, brought the Commonwealth into war and have lost his battle, many of them are questioning his leadership. However, they will ultimately, by the end of the war, choose to keep him in charge for the simple reason that they don't like his replacement. Growing more desperate, Augustus sent countless envoys to the Swedish king in the autumn of 1702. However, Charles would not accept any of the terms that were offered. Fearing that all of his offers to Charles would go unanswered, Augustus begged for the aid of his liege via the electorate of Saxony, the Holy Roman Emperor. Leopold I acquiesced, though his motives were not as selfless as they seemed, as the treaty he offered Charles stipulated that Sweden and Poland would end all hostilities and that all Saxon troops would leave to join the Imperial Army in the War of the Spanish Succession. Remember, the War of the Spanish Succession, for those who don't know what that is, at this time, I think it was in 1700, maybe 1701. Uh, the war begins in 1701, I'm pretty sure of that. Around the same time that the Great Northern War begins. Essentially, Charles the second, I think it is, of, uh, of, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna look it up very quickly. 
Yes, it was Charles II of Spain, who was incredibly inbred. Uh, of course, he was a Habsburg. He had the Habsburg gin. A gin, you know, um, very, like, a deformed individual. I think that he had, like, three ancestors, like his dad, granddad, and great-granddad, all of which had married their uh, nieces, I think it was, or aunts or something like that. I don't remember exactly. But yes, he was incredibly inbred, and um, he basically is it's surprising that he survived as long as he did. But there was an agreement with the French king, that French king Louis the Fourteenth, to be specific, that his son Philip would become king of Spain, which he did. However, when he became king of Spain, the French began to influence Spain. Now, of course, every other great power couldn't allow. France to gain influence in Spain. France was at this time the greatest European power on the continent. And of course, Spain, Spain was also a great power. So an alliance between the two, a permanent alliance between the two, could be a very bad thing. So um, yeah, they all meet in Hague, uh, or whatever you call it, in the Netherlands, Hague, I think that's how you say it, the Hague. Um, Austria, Netherlands, and Great Britain. And they all agree on a division of the Spanish Empire, but Philip remains in charge of Spain. But its empire should be divided, or at the very least, uh, made smaller. And, um, yeah. And all of this is happening while um, the Great Northern War is happening. And um, soon, uh, Denmark is actually going to send soldiers to fight in the Great Northern in the Spanish War of Spanish Secession. secession. Danish soldiers will fight in Blenheim, a very famous famous uh, battle during the uh, the War of Spanish Succession. Uh, it's a Marlboro battle. And Marlboro would even meet with Charles XII at one point and talk with him. I think we'll get to that later. But um, yeah, so I'll, so yeah, the reason why Denmark sends soldiers to fight in the War of Spanish Succession is actually because that will train the soldiers so that they can be used more effectively against Sweden again in the war of, in the Great Northern War. Missed even this offer, as he was determined to defeat Augustus completely. By 1703, Augustus was forced to flee Warsaw again, while Charles continued consolidating his position in Poland. Although we have neglected this theatre of war for some time, it is time to return to Ingria and Estonia. As Charles turned southwards after the Battle of Nava, Tsar Peter was given some much-needed time to reinforce and improve the Russian army. Boris Sheremetev, the only Russian commander to have escaped after the Battle of Nava, was given command over the Russian forces in the north. Small raids into Estonia and Ingria were conducted regularly during 1701, but they were not decisive by any means. The first serious attempt to probe the Swedish defences in the area was made in September when Sheremetev led a 7,000 strong army into Estonia. However, von Schlippenbach intercepted the Russian advance with a three times smaller army and defeated Sheremetev at Reuj. Sheremetev made another attempt with a much larger army under him and advanced into Estonia again in January 1702. Schlippenbach, this time outnumbered 6 to 1, gave battle at Arestfer and was forced to retreat after sustaining heavy casualties. After Arestfer... So now the Russians have reformed and are coming back. Uh, yeah. Perhaps Charles XII should have taken care of them while he could, because now they're coming back, their army is better. And um, yeah, they're just going to over overrun um, Estonia, especially, and... Uh, those area, the Baltic region, region, so. The Russians faced almost no significant opposition in the area and were able to advance deep into Ingria. In the autumn of 1702, the main Russian army under the command of Peter himself reached the Swedish fort of Notbori. As the Russians had lost all of their artillery at the Battle of Nava two years prior, they made an extraordinary effort to replace their lost and outdated artillery pieces, even going as far as to melt down church bells for material. The new Russian artillery corps was quite effective. The Swedish garrison of Notbori 
although mounting a serious defense, was forced to surrender after heavy bombardment and continuous assaults. The Swedish commander gave Peter the key to the city, which symbolized that Notbori was the key to the Neva River. Peter, recognizing that as well, renamed the city to Schlüsselburg and placed it under the command of his most trusted general, Menshikov. The siege, though relatively short, left the Russian army exhausted, and the Tsar's desire to repair and improve the fort gave them some time to recover. Charles was aware of the situation in the north, however he did not see the Russian advances as a significant threat, and continued pursuing his goals in Poland. As the campaigning... Kinda like Napoleon in a way. He has made many enemies, he's spreading himself out through across Poland, and soon Poland is gonna rise in rebellion. At least some parts of Poland, uh, many, no, not just some, many parts of it, but yeah, um, some nobles will, however, remain loyal to Charles XII. But now Russia is coming back soon, Denmark, okay, not soon, but in, the, uh, in a couple of years, Denmark will come back, and Norway will also be involved, and yeah, from there it just kind of collapses out of hand, and he, and of course the, the victory at Poltava, which we will get to, will also be very, very important in that. The season of 1703 began. The Russian army left Schlüsselburg and advanced towards the mouth of the river Neva. The mouth of the river was guarded by a fort called Nienkrenz. Hearing that the Russian army was approaching, the Swedish garrison burned the fort to the ground. Peter the Great captured what was left of Nienkrenz on the 1st of May, and on the 27th decided to found a new city there. Russia's future capital, St. Petersburg. In order to build the superior city and the fortresses around it, tens of thousands of serfs were forcefully brought to St. Petersburg. Along with them... Many of them will die in the construction because if you see, it's much of this area is marshlands. So many of them are gonna die in the process and yeah. But Peter didn't care. Peter also invited many architects, engineers and shipwrights from Western Europe to help him build the city of his dreams. These extraordinary efforts seem to have paid off, as by 1704 St. Petersburg began sprawling outwards from the main fortress, and two new fortresses were built alongside it. There were several Swedish attempts. It really does say something about Peter the Great, right? He built a city in an area which he hasn't, he haven't even, he has conquered it, but he is not formally given it. Like he doesn't own it yet, it's just occupied territory, but he builds a city there and already prepares to expand out of it. And yeah, it does say something about him, doesn't it? Back in Poland, Charles managed to obtain the support of enough of the Polish nobility to have Stanisław Leszczynski crowned as the new king. On the other hand, Augustus still mounted a significant resistance, as he controlled the majority of the Polish army. On the other hand, I'm, Paul, I'm going back a bit because I've always mispronounced his name, so... On the other hand, Augustus support of enough of the Polish nobility to have Stanisław Leszczynski crowned as the new king. On the other And Leszczynski, I always say that wrong, but Stanisław Leszczynski, he's basically a puppet. That's the entire point, he's a puppet. That's at least Charles XII's idea. He's elected by the Polish nobility, but he's really just there to keep Poland in place. He will become incredibly unpopular soon. And only really, only really a king in the areas occupied by the Swedish directly. And I mean, his, his unpopularity will lead to Augustus coming back. The hand, Augustus still mounted a significant resistance as he controlled the majority of the Polish army. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth subsequently descended into chaos as the Sandomierz Confederation, led by Augustus, and the Warsaw Confederation, led by Stanisław, began fighting a brutal civil war. Due to the chaotic nature of the conflict, forts and cities continuously changed hands between the two confederations and Sweden, and it's difficult to discern who controlled several parts of the Commonwealth at different points in time. In the summer of 1704, the Swedish fort of Narva fell to the Russian army, after a much more effective blockade and siege than four years earlier. 
It was at Narva that Peter signed a treaty with Augustus, granting the Saxon monarch significant subsidies, 12,000 Russian soldiers, and lands in Ruthenia in exchange for staying in the war. So now Peter the Great is not just a member of the coalition, he's now dominating it. He's now kind of choosing who is in the war and who is not, and he kind of makes it um, his war in a way. That's always how, how, I, how I have seen it. He's kind of the person who is making the deals, making the laws, not, no, not laws, but leading the war primarily and keeping the other members intact. And he's by far the one who gets the most out of it, and I think he knows that. He knows that if he can win this, he will get a lot of out, out of it and become the dominant power in the region. So that's why he begins to do so much, to keep the alliance, the coalition alive and all those sorts of things. Over the next year, the Russians and Saxons had devised a strategy to defeat the Swedish army and expel Charles from Poland. The Grodno campaign, as it later became known, aimed to capture the Swedish forces in a pincer movement with a three-sided offensive from Lithuania, Ruthenia and Saxony. Charles was not sitting idly either, and by the summer of 1705, he had convinced the Diet in Warsaw to start working on a peace treaty and to crown Stanisław as king. As what was going on in Warsaw was seen as a possible catastrophe for Augustus's war effort, not to mention the fact that it represented a significant hit to his pride, he knew that he had to act quickly. A large Saxon cavalry force was sent to assault Warsaw and to stop the coronation of Stanisław. Augustus's reckless endeavor ended in a complete disaster, as the force was defeated by a much smaller Swedish army and its commander was captured. Furthermore, the Saxon commander also divulged the strategic intentions of Augustus and his allies allowing the Swedes to thoroughly prepare for the upcoming Grodno campaign. As the majority of Livonia and Estonia were under Russian control by the beginning of the campaign, the main Russian army, along with large Saxon and Polish-Lithuanian contingents, set up for winter quarters at the fort of Grodno in Ruthenia. They expected a quick victory over the Swedish army after the campaigning season of 1706 began, However, they did not even get the chance to try. Much like his predecessor, Gustavus Adolphus, Charles force marched his army in the dead of winter and arrived at Grodno on the 24th of January. Lacking the artillery to assault the fort, Charles opted to cross the frozen Neman River and blockade the city. Seeing that the young king was preparing to encircle them, Augustus immediately left with 5,000 men hoping to reinforce his army in Saxony. Peter, unwilling to bring the rest of his army to relieve the siege, ordered Menchikov to leave the fort with the cavalry as soon as possible. Grodno fell in April, and the Russians lost more than a third of their initial force. They would have lost even more had Charles not misjudged the direction of Menchikov's retreat. Unable to pursue the Russian army through the thick marshlands of Polesia, Charles went westwards to seek a battle with the Saxons. As Charles was busy with the siege, Augustus had prepared to advance towards Warsaw. He led a 7,000-strong cavalry force, while the main body of the Saxon-Polish army was commanded by Schulenberg. A third Saxon army under Brausler was also advancing from Krakow. Schulenberg crossed the order on the 8th of February and advanced towards the town of Suava in Silesia. While this was taking place, Reinschild was resting in his winter quarters, which extended from Kostin to the border with Brandenburg. No sooner had he learned of the Saxon advance, he assembled his army and began marching towards the order. After discovering the movements of both Schulenberg and Brausser, Reinschild deduced that the two of them planned to avoid open battle with him and join forces at Poznan. To avoid any surprises, the Swedish commander retreated the same way from which he came and made sure to spread the word at every town and village that he was retreating and hoping to avoid open battle. Reinschild's information warfare proved successful. As Schulenberg gave credit to the rumors of a Swedish retreat, 
and decided to pursue the Swedish army instead of advancing towards Poznan. The Saxon general believed that the mere presence of his superior army would be enough to rout the Swedish force. With this strategy, Reinschild achieved two things. He drew Schulenberg's army away from any Allied forces and was able to choose a site of battle that was optimal for the Swedish army's size and composition. Upon both armies reaching the Fraustadt on the 13th of February, Reinschild started arraying his army in battle formation. It was at this point that Schulenberg realized that he had been deceived. However, he had to give battle, as it would have been scandalous for him to retreat with such a superior force. The Sac so now he has been tricked. He's isolated, but he's still going to do it anyway, because if he retreats, uh, the Polish, uh, the King of Poland, Augustus II, will, II will probably not like him that much. Force was it's about honor, it's about glory. And 20,000 strong with around 10,000 Saxon and 6,000 Russian infantry and 4,000 Saxon cavalrymen. Schulenberg assembled his infantry into two columns between the villages of Jägersdorf and Rostov, and in front of it he placed 31 cannons, 44 mortars and a chevaux de frise. 2,000 Saxon horsemen were placed on either wing. Reinschild had only 9,400 men at his disposal with 3,700 infantry and 5,700 cavalry. He placed his cavalry on the flanks and the majority of his infantry in a single line in the center, while some Karelians were also mixed in among the cavalry. Axel Spara commanded the infantry in the center, while Humahjelm led the left and Reinschild himself was in charge of the right. He's in a bad position. He has way fewer men and he has no artillery. That's a bad situation to be in. But, um, and he has to attack him because he's fortified now. So if he want, so, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. I got to be I'm honest. I'm not, re I'm not really that familiar with this battle, specific battle. So, yeah. Uh. As the Swedish army advanced, the Saxons waited until their enemies were at about 100 paces distance, then they fired all of their cannons and mortars. Although the Swedish army suffered some casualties during this barrage, they did not give the Saxons enough time for another one, as the centre and left started their charge. The Swedish centre's advance was at first checked. He does use it very effectively, I gotta admit. He tries to outflank them, which is probably the best thing to do in this situation if you have more cavalry. Um, than infantry, attack them head on to distract the infantry and try to hit, attack them from the sides. But I'm curious, what will this cavalry do? That can probably stop it, I think. By the Chevaux de Frise. However, after less than 15 minutes, the Swedish forces broke through. The Swedes, who were expertly trained at hand-to-hand -hand combat, charged their Saxon counterparts with swords and did not fire a single shot. In spite of being under constant fire, the ferocious Karolian onslaught forced the Saxons to retreat towards the village of Bersen. The Swedish wings had even more success, as the numerically inferior Saxon cavalry began fleeing after just several minutes of fighting. Only a handful of cavalry on the Saxon right, led by Colonel Kospot, mounted a desperate defense. However, they were surrounded and broken after the rest of their wing fell. The Swedish army is professional, like it's professional conscript army. They have their Indelingswerk, which is basically where they take, they have divided Sweden in various regions and take soldiers and fund their equipment and trains them uh, to become good soldiers. And you can see the effects of it here. Like they completely, despite the fact they're outnumbered, they completely overwhelmed them. So I, I don't know, that can, that speaks both about, that speaks both to um, the Swedish experience and professionalism, but also the incompetence of the Russians and the Saxons, at, at the very least the Saxons and Polish, I think. The Swedish right afterwards came upon the 6,000 Russian soldiers. The Russians had their uniforms turned inside out, as Schulenberg knew that they were inexperienced and Reinschild would target them. Their weakness was revealed, though. 
the Russians fired only one volley at the Swedes, before throwing down their arms and retreating behind the Wall of Spikes. After removing the Shavoda Frieze there, Reinschild chased down the entire Russian force and massacred them all. As all of the Saxon cavalry had fled, their Swedish counterparts were now free to surround the remainder of the army on all sides. Much like Hannibal, almost two millennia before him, Reinschild executed a double envelopment perfectly, forcing the remainder of the Saxon army to surrender. And with that, the entire Saxon army, raised with so much toil, care and expense, and which was twice the size of the Swedish army, had been defeated in less than an hour's time. Impressive. Reinschild did very good from, very well for himself. Yeah, he seems like a very experienced commander. I got, again, I don't really have a lot of experience with this specific battle. But yeah, there's no denying the Swedish are uh, great at this. But, um, kind of like Napoleon, I think. Good, a uh, good professional army, but if you lose too many of those soldiers in too many wars, how's it gonna look like at the end? Are you gonna, does Charles, if Charles uh, keeps losing his veterans in these successful, but, Many, the many battles which are successful, successful, but at the same time, if he loses too many of them, it might change. It might change. The Saxons lost more than 7,000 men during the battle itself, and had almost all of the rest imprisoned, with the total losses amounting to about 15,000 to 16,000. The Swedes lost around 400 men and also had around 1,000 men injured. Augustus's biggest problem, however, was that the road to Saxony now lay wide open and undefended. Augustus, who linked up with Brausa and had 12,000 men at his disposal, was only 80 kilometers away from Fraustadt when the battle took place. Shocked at the news of his grand army's complete defeat at the hands of an inferior Swedish force, Augustus hastily retreated to Krakow. Since Peter the Great was unwilling to send his army to even relieve the siege of Grodno, there wasn't any hope of Russian aid for them either. After his victory at Grodno, Charles XII turned west to prepare for the upcoming invasion of Saxony. In the next few months... At this time, uh, Charles XII is so, is so powerful that he can dictate uh, other European powers to do his uh, bidding. Essentially, Habsburgs are no longer standing in his way. They are afraid that if they do, they, he will join the war of Spanish succession on the French side, perhaps. So um, he actually invades. So he, when he goes through uh, Silesia, which is Habsburg territory, and into Saxony, he's allowed to do so. Nobody stands in his way. He's, he's so... Even other European powers at this time are afraid of him. Augustus desperately tried to negotiate a peace with Charles, even offering to split up the Commonwealth between himself and Stanislav. As autumn began, the Swedish armies marched into Saxony and quickly occupied Leipzig. Without any other options, Augustus agreed to all Swedish demands and signed the Treaty of Eltrenstadt. According to the treaty, he would renounce all of his claims to the Polish and Lithuanian crowns, annul treaties with Russia, and extradite the Swedish traitor Johann Patko. In order to humiliate his personal... Who would be killed in a very horrifying way. I don't remember the specifics, but I think Patko is like ran over with a... When they fi find him, the Swedish army, I think he's crushed under a wheel or something horrible like that. Um, and they did meet each other in real life, the two were actually met in Saxony, uh, Augustus and Charles XII, who are cousins. Or enemy, Charles also forced Augustus to congratulate Stanislav on his victory and coronation. In only six years, the young and capable Charles XII eliminated two of his three enemies. The time had finally come that he would turn his attention to Russia. The Great Northern War was entering its most critical stage. Our series will continue in the coming weeks, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our video- Alright, amazing. Very well done, I think.
I, uh, this battle is not one I'm particularly familiar with, but the next video is gonna be a lot of fun, I think. Um, but yeah, great video. Go on, go and check. Make sure to check uh, the original video by Kingston Generals. They do great stuff over there. But um, but yeah, if you like the video, please like and subscribe and um, and leave a comment down below. What did you think of it? Do you have anything to bring into uh, this this area? Do you know anything about this area that you want to share with us all here? Then do it. But um, yeah, I see you guys next time.